start of the new series of lectures about the Goring Gambit, or as we call it, the Scotch Gambit. So after e4 and e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4. So we are going into the very, I would say, interesting the outcome of the Scotch opening line after e takes d4. In, in that position we are studying in our previous lectures the bishop c4 line which after knight f6 could lead to a, the classical two knights defense. After bishop c5 somehow it could lead to the quite sharp lines with short cast knight f6 and e4, e5. However instead of bishop c4 or knight takes d4 which is a classical scotch opening line which becomes very popular after Kasparov played it in the, his world championship match against Anatoly Karpov in 1990 the other move just deserves our attention is this is a c3 move so what is going to sacrifice a pawn and after d takes c3 instead of uh, going with the course of the Danish Gambit, which we just already studied in our lectures after bishop c4, which allows black to capture another pawn with c takes b2 and bishop takes b2, and white has quite serious compensation for the material deficit. White could just capture on c3 immediately, and get quite a good development but just for one pound down. So this position after knight takes c3 we call the Goring Gambit or the Scotch Gambit and these opening lines uh, still very popular on the intermediate and beginner levels and uh, even I find a few players who use it uh, quite successfully in, uh, even on master and even grandmaster level. So what compensation one has for his sacrificed pawn? Of course this is a quite serious difference from the Danish Gambit because uh, with the knight on c3 white has I would say more control over the d5 square but his dark square bishop never goes to b2 in these lines. Indeed white is continuing with the same course like in the Danish Gambit. It means that we are bringing the bishop to c4 looking towards the weakest spot in black's position, the f7 pawn. The queen d1 to b3 always is a great opportunity for white just to increase the pressure over the f7 pawn. Because knight on c3 is controlled so good the d5 square and e4 square, so white could have the opportunity to push the pawn after e4, e5. Already, after knight takes c3, we can understand that it's not so simple for black to develop his pieces. For instance, after knight f6, bishop c4, and bishop c5, while has quite unpleasant e4, e5 move. In that case, it's not so clear where to go with the knight on e5. Move like queen e7, not going to solve any of the black's problems after short casting. So clearly that capturing on e5 will lead to the immediate disaster with rookie one white is using quite well known the tactical resource when both king and the queen are on the same file and after rookie one the queen is pinned the game is over and if after short cast and black is moving his knight away, let's say to g8, then white is just getting huge advantage by playing knight d5 or even by playing bishop g5. The position is really, really tough for black. So it means that it's a big difference from the Danish gambit where more or less black has a few opportunity with bishop b4 check or d6 or knight c6 here and black has to make the decision